Um, well, welcome to all of you um, from all over the country. Uh, as Trudy said, I'm Suba Sadi, and I'm a volunteer community ambassador with ARP here in Northern Virginia. From our earliest beginnings, ARP has championed lifelong learning. That's why ARP Virginia is thrilled to bring you our third year of Tuesday Explorers, a lifelong learning program offered every Tuesday from January through the end of April at three o'clock Eastern time for your curious explorers. For more than 60 years, AARP has been a wise friend and fierce defender, helping individuals to ensure that their money, health, and happiness live as long as they do. AARP has earned a reputation as a wise friend and fierce defender through trusted information, tools, and advocacy designed to protect the health and financial security of older Americans and empower them to choose how they live as they age. By promising to act as a wise friend and fierce defender, ARP is helping people who are 50 plus and their families feel confident, in control, and secure as they age. As a wise friend in your corner, ARP helps you to protect yourself and your loved ones from fraud, get healthy and stay healthy, care for loved ones, make connections, plan a trip, learn new technologies, attend a class, and have fun like we're going to have today with our Tuesday Explorer program. I hope you will continue to take advantage of these opportunities and more. Well, let me tell you a little bit about our excellent program today. Um, of course, in celebration of Black History Month and Black History is Manassas history. An enslaved woman who met and shook hands with a president, another born enslaved with no formal education, who founded a school for African-American studies that was continuous operation for over 40 years, a local family that helped establish the first black church and the first primary school for African-American children. And let me tell you a little bit about our speaker. Ms. Rachel Goldberg is program and events coordinator at the Manassas Museum. She's responsible for ensuring the dynamic schedule of programs at the museum and works to ensure public engagement in the heritage of the city and its various historic sites. In addition to creating unique and enjoyable experience for diverse audiences that highlight the city's spirit and charm. Rachel has co-authored award-winning teaching kits and family guides based on museum collections. Before joining the Manassas Museum, Rachel held positions at the Phillips Collections, the National Gallery of Art, and the George Eastman Museum. She has also developed and taught summer and after school art programs for youth and communities with the greatest need through organizations such as Girls Incorporated of Metro Denver and Project Create in Washington, D.C. Rachel lives in Manassas with her partner and their cat, dog, dogs, and chickens. Rachel, I welcome you to Tuesday Explorers, and the floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Suba. Thanks for the great introduction. Uh, thank you, everyone, for um, having me as an honorary Tuesday Explorer. I am happy to be here. I um, heard from Trudy in the beginning that some of you are from the area, have been to the area, have spent time in the area. I hope that you have <clears throat> visited the Manassas Museum in your travels. Um, and for those of you in the area, I hope that you'll come visit the renovated uh, and newly re-envisioned Manassas Museum uh, this fall when we reopen. Um, I just want to say from the outset, um, it, from the very beginning, that I'm experiencing some technical difficulties, um, both physically and um, environmentally. I'm having some lighting issues. I think right now we've got it under control. I just wanted to give you a heads up if it starts to look like I go into shadow or something, it's just the lighting. Um, and I woke up this morning, sadly, with a little bit of a cold. So <clears throat> if you hear me doing that, or if I have to, uh, you know, go over here to cough or blow my nose, I'll be right back. Um, so as Trudy said in the very beginning, uh, Black history is American history. And as Suba just mentioned, Black history is also the history of our area here in Manassas in Prince William County. Um, I'm going to 
give you all, I understand that uh, uh, my colleague Bill Backus was here last Tuesday to talk with you a bit about Black history in Prince William County. Um, and I'm going to give you sort of a very broad brush overview today of uh, some of the uh, important rich Black history in Manassas. And then <clears throat> it's my understanding that we'll have time in the end for some questions, if anybody has any questions. I'm going to go semi-chronologically through these slides, um, but we we do sort of bounce around a little bit in ideas. We've got some great stories in here, um, and I'm really looking forward to sharing them with you. When my slides advance. There we go. Okay, so... We're going to start out with Liberia House. And again, I think I, I'm sure that those of you who live in the area have <clears throat> seen Liberia House, been to a program at Liberia House, driven past Liberia House. Uh, this house was built in 1825 when William and Harriet Ware arrived in Manassas with a few enslaved people. They showed up in 1825 with around 15 to 20 enslaved people. Uh, those enslaved people that they brought with them, along with some probably white craftsmen, did all of the work to build the house. They made every brick, they felled every tree that created the lumber that went into building you know, the rafters in the attic and the floors <clears throat> and so on. Uh, we haven't been able to find any solid verification for the meaning of the name of the house, Liberia House, but we do know that William Ware was an active member of the American Colonization Society. And if you're not familiar with them, the American Colonization Society was a group of white Americans who advocated for and raised money for sending free Blacks in America to Liberia and Africa. Over time, Liberia House became one of the largest farms in Northern Virginia, enslaving over 80 men, women, and children. If you're familiar with the area around Liberia House, you know that it's very developed today with shopping centers and condominium housing and, and other housing. Um, and unfortunately, because of that development, there's no evidence left of the dwellings where the enslaved people lived although it's likely that some of the enslaved would have lived inside the house. So we believe that some of the enslaved who worked in the kitchen uh, may have lived in the basement area, which was part of um, this. The, so the basement part of the house was part of this kitchen um, uh, wing of the house. That kitchen wing, if you've been by Liberia House recently, that kitchen wing no longer exists. Um, but you can see it here in this picture from 1862. Uh, this dependency um, appears in, in pictures from eight, the, like 1861, 1862, and then in pictures from after the Civil War, it's gone. We don't know what happened to it. We just know it's no longer there. But we know that enslaved people would have been doing all of the work in the kitchen dependency. They would have been uh, probably doing laundry in there. They would have been smoking meats and, and other things, uh, doing their cooking and canning. And then the kitchen dependency, like I mentioned, adjoined with the basement where there was also a, a warming um, hearth uh, and, and possibly uh, housing for some enslaved people. Uh, the enslaved pe people at Liberia would have done everything, everything from the housework, the sewing, the cooking, the cleaning, the field work, um, such as planting and harvesting. They would have cared for the animals. They would have done the husbandry. They would have uh, built and maintained all the structures on the property. Um, and this was at, at its height, a 2000 acre farm. Um, so essentially anything that needed doing was done by an enslaved person here at Liberia House. Uh, during the Civil War, the house was pressed into service as headquarters, first for the Confederate Army, and then about a year or so later for the Union. The Ware family stayed in the house for as long as they could, and eventually they evacuated to Fluvanna County, which is in southern Virginia, with around 25 of their enslaved people. I think they they left some behind uh, to uh, sort of keep the house uh, is the way it's it's told, um, and and there's one family 
that we know a bit about. And that's one family that was left behind uh, to help keep the house uh, during the occupation. Um, and during, and that's the Naylor family. I'm not sure if any of you have heard that name before. Uh, some of you in the area, if you've come to any programs uh, or visited the museum, you may have heard about the Naylor family or seen any of our videos on social media. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about them in a minute. Uh, but during the occupation, uh, during the Union occupation of the house um, in 1862, President Lincoln visited the house. We have that in the official record. Um, and when he came to the house to uh, meet with his general, uh, we have a third person account from much, much later in the 19 teens that said that Nellie Naylor uh, tell, told a story of uh, meeting President Lincoln and shaking hands with him on the porch at uh, Liberia House. She apparently said he was a kind man. Um, so again, we don't know much about the, the majority of the enslaved population at Liberia House. Um, sadly, we know some names here and there, um, and we know a lot of the work that they would have done, um, but we don't know uh, specifics about the majority of the enslaved people who lived and worked there. But we do know a bit about the Naylor family. Uh, this is Laniel Naylor in blue right here on the left. Um, she's a descendant of Samuel and Nellie Naylor, who were two of the original 25 that the Ware family brought with them um, in 1825 when they came to build the house. Um, so it's thanks to Laniel that we still know a bit about um, her family and and their and uh, the, their way of life and and at Liberia House. Uh, so Nellie and Samuel Naylor, and this is Nellie here, seen seated in this picture. This is her daughter Sarah or Sally, um, standing. Uh, Nellie and Samuel Naylor were brought brought to Liberia in 1825, and they helped build the house that the Ware family lived in. Uh, we think that Nellie also. Uh, uh, probably cared for the children and did a lot of the housework. Um, she was a very trusted enslaved person, which was one of the reasons why she was left behind to care for the house, to make sure that the house survived the Civil War. Uh, Samuel and Nellie had seven children, five of whom were born at Liberia. And before the Civil War, Samuel was able to buy his freedom. After the war, Mr. Naylor bought 62 and a half acres of land from Mr. Ware, the white man who owned the property. And uh, the Prince William County deed book uh, records it as such. So I'm going to read directly from the deed book. I don't, I don't just talk like this. Um, so uh, William Ware and his uh, sons, essentially, sell with special warranty to faithful ser servant Nellie and husband Samuel Naylor for $525, 65 acres, two roods, and five poles, which are apparently different uh, measures of land, uh, 12 and a half acres of which is given for love and affection to the former servant. So that's how we know that uh, well, that's one of the ways that we know that Nellie was left behind to keep the house. It's a rare thing that uh, uh, an enslaved person was gifted land from their uh, previous owner. So uh, Nellie and Samuel, for $525, get this 65 acres, but 12 and a half of that is a gift from the Ware family. Um, so next, after the Civil War, there are a number of African Americans who are now free and have either chosen to live in Manassas or have wound up here due to circumstances beyond their control. This, this city ordinance that you see on the screen right here on the left is from the 19 teens, but we imagine that the parameters around which Black Manassans were allowed to build and reside were created around existing informal Black neighborhoods. So after the Civil War, uh, the uh, the the dividing line of the city and you can see well it's not the greatest map but so if you're looking at this map you can see right here this green dot is the Manassas Museum with the train depot right across the street and this red dot is Liberty Street now so if we go over here and this is the train depot the railroad tracks run right along here and the railroad tracks became the dividing line 
between the black neighborhoods and the white neighborhoods very early on. And so we think that uh, what, like when this ordinance was passed in 1917, that uh, that the segregation ordinance was based on existing neighborhoods and places where there was already uh, segregation. It's just that the ordinance then made it law. Um, so again, after the city uh, or after the Civil War, Black Manassans, uh, a number of them stay in the area uh, and uh, and neighborhoods are built up. And this neighborhood right here with the little red dot on it is one that we're going to talk about a little bit. This is um, Liberty Street. So this little dog leg right here. So for those of you, again, those of you in the area or from the area, this big street right here is Grant Avenue. That's a major thoroughfare. And this street right here is Prince William Street. So Liberty Street is just a little diagonal street that runs from uh, from Prince William Street down to Grant Street or Grant Avenue, but it um, it was a very very pivotal neighborhood for the African American community um, in the late 1860s and early 1870s, right after the Civil War. Uh, this neighborhood in this neighborhood. Um, one of the first black churches in the area was uh, founded. The first school for black children was founded um, and, and the community, this Liberty Street neighborhood really became the beating heart of the, of the black community in Manassas. So these are two uh, uh, notable figures, notable residents of Liberty Street. Uh, this is, we actually, we believe this to be um, and actually this caption is wrong, sorry, uh, but we believe this on the left to be William Lomax and his son Daniel on the right. So we've got William Lomax, the elder here on the left and Daniel here on the right. Uh, William was born in 1825, uh, enslaved to the Walker family at Mount Elba in King and Queen County. He served as a substitute during the Civil War and his wife, Sarah, who was also born enslaved, um, uh, sorry, his wife, Sarah, and all six of their children were also uh, born enslaved. An interesting um, thing is that all six of their children would eventually graduate from college. Uh, William, so William Lomax, again, the gentleman on the left here in the picture, used some of the money um, that he made as a substitute in the Civil War to purchase eight acres of land on Liberty Street in 1869. He purchased that eight acres for $144. Um, and interestingly, he could not sign his name at the time. He made an X on the uh, paperwork. Uh, a little while later, oops, sorry. A little while later, another uh, three acres were purchased in 1870, which was around the time when he built the house that he lived in for the rest of his life. And that's the house that you see here on the top. Uh, he built this house in 1870 and lived it, it until he died in 1900. The house was lived in by members of the family up until the uh, recent years. Uh, and then I think in 2018 or 19, it was bought by a developer, but they, they maintained incredible detail in the history. They renovated the house. Um, in a way that really honored William Lomax and what he um, built literally here on Liberty Street. He also built the house next door that you can just kind of barely see in both of these pictures. And uh, that was the house that his son Daniel lived in. Um, so both of these houses were built by uh, William Lomax and uh, he lived in them again until uh, he died in 1900. The 1870 census shows that the head of the house for 9512 Liberty Street, which is this house, uh, was William Lomax. And he it, sh it shows that he's a shoemaker and the property was valued at $1,300. So pretty good return on his 144. 
Um, and again, he also built that house next door as well. So all of that is on his original 11 acres of land. So in 1900, just before, just months before his death, William sold all 11 acres to his son, Daniel. And interestingly, we see on that paperwork that uh, William has become literate because instead of signing with an X on this later paperwork, he signs his full signature. Um, in 1922, Daniel Lomax, the son, retires from his job at the U.S. Mint, and we think he was in need of a birth certificate for his uh, for something to do with his pension. And when he couldn't find a birth certificate, uh, the best we can tell. Now, again, you know, I said that the developers did a great job of really um, honoring the history of this home when they renovated it uh, in 2000 and 2020. They they kept a lot of the paperwork and things that they found and donated it to the museum. So we are so fortunate to have this paperwork uh, from the house. It was in the house uh, when they bought it. And this is a letter that Daniel Lomax wrote to his former owner uh, because he needed proof of his birth. He needed proof of the date of his birth uh, for something to do with his retirement. So you can see uh, that this letter is written by uh, A.C. Walker of Walkerton in Queen and King or King and Queen County, Virginia. Um, and it says that to the best of his knowledge and belief, Daniel Lomax was born in the year of 1848. He was a slave of my father's uh, temple walker. And we lived on the same farm until during the war. The reason I remember his age is he was born the same year my nephew, uh, Bernard, I can't read the last name, was born in 1848, given under my hand the 16th day of September, 1922. And we know that 1922 is the year that Daniel Lomax retired. So again, that we're sort of inferring that uh, he needed proof of uh, his birth date and for something to do with his uh, retirement. So again, another uh, important part of life on Liberty Street in Manassas was First Baptist Church. For first Baptist Church was the first African-American church in Manassas and was found one year prior to the founding of the city. It was founded in 1872. So they just celebrated their 150th anniversary last year. Daniel Lomax was pivotal in helping to establish the church and was a pastor who filled in. He was a fill-in pastor. Uh, it was Reverend Williams who was the uh, founding pastor of the church, but Daniel Lomax filled in for Reverend Williams uh, on occasion. And he also, Daniel Lomax also had a liquor license. So it's that old uh, five card poker on Saturday night, church on Sunday mornings. He was living that, that line. Uh, now, next up, we have the Brown School. I mentioned that when it opened in 1870, the Brown School, which was originally called the Manassas Village Colored School, was the second public school opened in Manassas and the first for African-American students. So uh, there was, I, I believe it was the Ruffner School was built in 1869 uh, for white children. And then the Manassas Village Colored School was opened in 1870 for African-American students. It was first located on the corner of Prince William and Liberty Streets. Uh, after a few years, they picked the building up and moved it down the street. And uh, that's where the building still sits today. So this is the building on top here. And it's it still exists. This building still exists. It's just, uh, it's now a private residence. It's somebody's home. Um, but it was, like I said, it was first located at the corner of Prince William and Liberty Street. And it's now at 9508 Liberty Street. And we're about to I think actually we already did put a historic marker in there marking this um, this landmark. Uh, so it it eventually uh, a new Brown School was opened um, off uh, on Prince William Street down towards Jefferson Street, and I'll I'll talk to you a little bit about that in a minute. Um, the Brown School was named after a member of the Quaker Society of Philadelphia, uh, which paid the majority of the school's expenses, um, even after it was absorbed into the monastic Manassas District School Board. Um, there were a number of uh, costs 
that the Manassas School Board uh, refused to pay uh, because it was a school for uh, African American children. So the Quaker Society of Philadelphia uh, paid the majority of the school's expenses. Uh, in 1880, in 1893. This is it's an interesting comparison uh, regarding the disparity in pay between teachers in an African-American school and teachers in, a, in the white Ruffner school. In 1893, the principal teacher was getting paid $25 a month and the assistant teacher was getting $20 a month. Now at the white Ruffner school, the principal teacher was getting $40 a month and the assistant teacher was getting $25 a month. So we're looking at a pretty, Pretty big disparity there. So the school saw some rough times and was threatened with closure on more than one occasion. It, but it was when a woman principal, Mrs. White, took over that things began to change for the better. With the building in shambles, money was raised for a new building and $6,500 was received from the Rosenwald Foundation. So if you're not familiar with the Rosenwald Foundation, it was a foundation that was started by the CEO of Sears at the time, Julius Rosenwald, and it was a foundation that funded the building of schools in African American communities throughout the South. And I, I think there were thousands of Rosenwald schools uh, all over the South, and a number of them still exist today. Sadly, ours is no longer there uh, on Prince William Street, but we know what it looks like thanks to the painstaking records of the Prince William County uh, um, school archives. So we got this great picture from our colleagues at Prince William County. Uh, this new school served the community, it served as the hub for the community. Um, there were social activities that happened there, plays, spelling bees, community suppers, Christmas pageants, everything you can imagine. It was as much a school as it was a community center. Uh, in 1954, as I'm sure you all know, the Brown versus Board of Brown versus Board of Education declared school segregation unconstitutional, and Brown school students were moved to a local high school. Um, and this Rosenwald building was abandoned and then later demolished. The second Brown school building, like I said, still stands there on Liberty Street, but it's a private residence. So we're going to stay on the theme of schooling. And it, it looks like y'all are already asking questions, so I'm excited, uh, but I'll try not to race through to get to your questions. So we're going to stay on the, on the subject of scholarship, and we're going to talk a bit about Jenny Dean and the Manassas Industrial School. So Miss Jane Sarepta Jean, who is known as Jenny Dean, was born enslaved near Sudley Springs, Virginia, which is kind of out by the battlefield. Uh, sometime between 1848 and 1853, we don't have a precise birth date for her. Um, she and her sisters and her parents uh, all worked for and were owned by the Newman families at Marble Hill and later the Cushing family until the Civil War ended their bondage. At the conclusion of the Civil War, Jenny Dean was about 13 years old. She was young and she had a very strong head on her shoulders. Jenny Dean was described as, quote, a woman of God, unafraid, and as having a, quote, magnetic winning smile. It was also mentioned that she was smart, kind, and deeply religious, and that she was a natural born leader and an organizer. A quote from the book on Undaunted Faith, which was a book that was written by a doctor who attended the Manassas, Manassas Industrial School. Uh, so the it's, quote, 1865 marked the close of the Civil War and the legal extermination of the Institute of Human Slavery. There were millions of ex-slaves, poor beyond measure, and homeless and without means of support. Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and it was at this time, and with no formal education, when Miss Dean, just a young teenager, made her way to Washington, D.C. to find work to help support herself and her family. On the weekends, Miss Dean would return home to Manassas, teaching Sunday school classes and helping to establish a number of churches in Northern Virginia, including Mount, uh, Mount Cavalry Baptist Church in uh, Catharpin, Virginia, where she's uh, buried today. Um, she died of a stroke in May of 1913. But before that, 
when she wasn't teaching Sunday school or working in DC, she was teaching cooking or sewing. She really wanted to make sure that the young girls in her community had skills and knowledge um, as well as uh, scholarship. Um, she, she realized that there were few, if any, opportunities for young African Americans to receive an education in uh, skills or academics beyond the education or elementary education level. The Brown School was an elementary level school for Black children that was open as early as 1870, as we talked about, uh, but there was no opportunity for a scholarly education beyond the elementary level in the area. She also saw young African American teenagers going to DC to look for work and ending up destitute and on the streets or toiling in labor jobs in Northern Virginia. And she so she encouraged local parents to work to save money for their families while she went out and raised the funds to build an industrial school. She told them to quote, keep your children at home. Don't send them to the cities. You must buy your lands and become taxpayers. Make all you can and save all you can. Meanwhile, I will go out and raise the money to build a school where your children, excuse me, may be educated to trades. You do your part here and I will do mine in the world. And she certainly did. Here's a memory of Mr. Oswald Garrison Villard, owner and editor of the New York Evening Post. Um, he was an advocate of the school. He would later really become Jenny Dean's adversary. He was a the chairman of the board for a number of years. But this is what he said on how Jenny Dean, quote, won all those friends and counselors of the North. He said, quote, she was not an orator. She had not the charm of Miss Bethune, talking about Mary McLeod Bethune. I think it was her own straightforward honesty and refusal to pretend to be anything else than what she was, a plain woman unashamed of being a cook who made money to help the school and her people. I was much interested by the deep impression she made upon my Southern wife. There was nothing servile about her. She did not play up to or toady to the whites. She was just a plain, simple, dignified black woman with no gift of oratory and no charm beyond what I have said of her, her straightforwardness and sincerity. I've always thought if people say that about me after I die, I have done my job here. I just think that's a beautiful quote. So Miss Dean promised to do her part in the world and raise the necessary funds to open the school, and she held up her end of the bargain. She sought funding all along the East Coast. Um, all uh, uh, She met with the East Coast elite, and she, uh, she developed fundraising committees um, in Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, and New York. Eventually, the money was raised and the school was built, and the keynote speaker on opening day was none other than the man himself, the Honorable Frederick Douglass. In his speech, he said this. Um, it was a very long speech. I have transcripts of it I can share. Um, actually, the Library of Congress has a transcript of the speech that he gave on, um, on opening day, but this is just one little quote. Um, he said, to found an educational institution for any people is worthy of notice, but to found a school in which to instruct, improve, and develop all that is noblest and best in the souls of a deeply wronged and long neglected people is especially noteworthy. It is to be a place where the children of a once enslaved people may realize the blessings of liberty and education and learn how to make for themselves and for all others the best of both worlds. And education means emancipation. It means light and liberty. If you know Frederick Douglass, you know he took education very seriously. And, and I think that his uh, coming to Manassas to give the keynote speech um, at opening day really uh, uh, tells of Jenny Dean's dedication and the respect uh, that she garnered from her donors and from the community. So now I'm going to I'm going to leap forward in time uh, from the 1890s on up to uh, the 1940s and 50s. So um, it's worth it though. I hope you don't mind the quick time travel. Um, I'm going to share with you another one of our Manassas greats. This is, I introduce you to Wilmer Fields. Uh, Wilmer Fields was a renowned baseball player in the Negro Leagues. He was a pitcher who also um, occasionally played third base. He was recruited out of college 
uh, to play for the DC-based Homestead Grays in 1939, and he spent his entire career playing for the Homestead Grays. In the offseason, he continued his college education um, while also playing football and basketball, and he received a number of offers uh, from major league organizations, but he, he always said that he enjoyed what he was doing and he didn't want to leave. Eventually, he went on to play in Canada and in Mexico and in a number of other international organizations. Um, eventually, Fields became part of the new Negro League Baseball Players Association, which was an association that helped raise money for income-strapped former members and bring attention to the Negro League and its former players. Um, Wilmer Fields died of a heart ailment at his home in Manassas when he was 81 years old, and I believe that was relatively recently. I want to say it was 2006 or so. Um, we've done some uh, uh, interviews with family members, and uh, we were really excited a couple of years ago when uh, just a, a, a resident of Manassas found this baseball that you see on the right-hand side here um, that was signed by Wilmer Fields. And we now have that in the museum collection. So we are always grateful to people who find stuff in their basements and attics and uh, bring it to us at the museum to keep and preserve so that we can share these histories with everyone, with all of you moving forward. And that's all I have for you. I just have this picture um, of me and my dog. <laughs> if uh, you and my uh, email, if anybody wants to reach out with other questions, but I know we have time for more questions. I'm gonna set the slide back to Wilmer instead of me. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel, thank you very much. I only have one question in the uh, question and answer box that goes back to the very top of your presentation. Um, and that was with regard to the individuals that worked in the homes. Is there information available in the museum or the research, or do you have a personal opinion on whether or not the kitchen help was permitted to eat some of the food they prepared? Oh, like, so I don't know. I have, so we don't know for sure. Uh, <laughs> we don't, I mean, this is the terrible thing about, I mean, it's one thing about the devastation of the civil war is that really no paperwork survived, right? So anything that was written down about the way they lived who lived with whom, all of that, all of those papers are gone. Anything, any paper that was in that house is gone, long gone. So, um, but we can, I think, safely assume based on the way we know enslaved people lived and worked around uh, their white owners, I think it's safe to assume that they probably made separate meals. There was usually a um, uh, uh, meals made for uh, the white family and their company um, and their visitors, and then separate meals made for the enslaved, um, usually with rations that they were given or things that they grew in their gardens or um, livestock that they were able to raise on their own. Very good. Thank you. Uh, when will the museum reopen? Apparently someone knows you're closed. <laughs> um, great. So uh, fingers crossed. We're going to reopen in the fall. So stay tuned for some um, announcements about what that's going to look like. And we hope, I hope to see you in the galleries. <laughs> Very good. I, I will acknowledge a question from one of our audience members, Ellen. And I can only say that I personally agree with your comment. And if I have anything to do with it, I will make that happen. And that's all I can say about that, Rachel. <laughs> okay. All right. I think you can make it happen, Trudy. <laughs> One other question was, what year was Wilmer born with regard to Wilmer Fields? Do that's a great year? question. And I don't have that uh, in my notes. But I believe he was 81 when he died around 2006. So that kind of gives you a general. Okay. No one told me that there was going to be a map I was going to say, I'll let you do the map program. On that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and it looks as though that is all the questions that I have. I'm going to do a real quick run through. There was one question with regard to um, getting a recording of this program. And yes, uh, we are recording this program and a copy of the recording will be in a follow up email. And Suba, give me one quick second. All the rest of the comments are very interesting presentation, beautiful presentation. Thank you so much for your Thank time. Thank you. And your Thank energy. you all for listening to me ramble on for 30, 40 minutes. <laughs> and Suba, I will turn the program back over to you. All righty. Um, one of our listeners did uh, actually answer that question. It was 1922. I don't see it anymore. Do you see it, Trudy? Uh, Maybe just, it's in the chat. She, I think she answered the question of uh, uh, when he was born. He was born August 2nd, 1922. There, there we go. Yeah. Thank you, Google. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we always have uh, amazing uh, listeners out there, uh, the people who tune in. So, Rachel, thank you. Um, uh, let me just provide some uh, closing comments on behalf of ARP Virginia. Uh, again, thank you to Rachel for sharing her valuable time and knowledge with us this afternoon. Um, what I learned from today, uh, Rachel, is that how instrumental churches were uh, for the Black community and education. Uh, it, just amazing uh, how much of a, uh, how they uh, did the education and how, what that key part to, it was to the families. Uh, but to to the folks who are listening, who tuned in, we'd love to get your feedback on today's program and ideas for future programs. In the chat box, you'll see a link to the survey, to a, to a survey, excuse me. Please click on the link and take a few moments to share your feedback with us. We'll also send this link in a follow-up email later today. Our Tuesday Explore programs will continue next week and we invite you to join us. So next week, It'll be, the title is The Extraordinary Story of Batestown, Virginia. The Extraordinary Story of Batestown, Virginia. And a reminder, that's next Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, and then, of course, you, you've already seen the link and everything there. In the chat box, you'll see a link to register for our upcoming programs. Of course, that's www.arp.org. Uh, you'll see all that there. Uh, and until next time, uh, we encourage you to stay curious and keep exploring. And thank you again for Zooming with us today. Thank you for having me. <laughs>